Welcome to the G and J B show. We're in episode number forty nine. Jack Bowen, who we got today, mate? We've got Mr. Steve Andrews, Doctor Steve Andrews. Doctor. How are you, mate? Good, good. Pleasure to be here, mate. It's so good. We've known you for well, probably ten years, I say, 10, the bo- yeah. the, since the boys have been coming in the gym. Um, mate, tell us uh, where it all started, where you grew up, and we'll we'll go deep and we'll go into your life and find a, a little bit about you. Oh, well, I was, uh, I was born in Rockhampton, um, what, 52 plus years ago now. Um, wasn't there long, grew up in Brisbane and went to school in Brisbane and, and uh, yeah, I had all my junior years here and um, oh, played a bit of junior sport, bit of, bit of rugby, bit of AFL, um, did a bit of swimming, um, went to school, uh, Camp Hill Primary and then Churchy, went to Churchy for high school. Um, and then off to uni to do medicine. So I've been Brisbane most of my life. Mate, were you always going to go into medicine? Is that the way it was going? Or how, how did school go for you? Uh, yeah, school was all right. I, didn't, I, I found school easy. Like, school wasn't a, the, the academic part of it. Um, I always had a good memory. So, mm. so exams and things never worried me. So um, I guess that bit was easy. I, I wanted to do medicine from a fairly young age. I'm not really sure why. It just interested me. Your um, parents weren't involved or anything? Um, my, my biological father's a, a doctor, and, and but I never really knew him growing up, and maybe that has some influence, I don't know. But uh, but it was something, um, I, I think it was, uh, it was more an interest thing for me. It was, it was what interested me and what I wanted to do. Um, and I was pretty sure of that from a fairly young age, like certainly before I finished, well before I finished school. So um, that was a target for me to get into that and do that and see where it led. As far as getting to where I am now, though, that's an unusual thing. Like people often ask that, and, I, and I've, I've done podcasts and things before, and people say, "Oh, well, you know, how, how does that course go?" But it's it's kind of not like that. It's like branches on a tree. You know, you, you start off going, well, I think I want to do medicine, and you do that, and then you finish that, and then there's a, another fork in the road, you know, do, do yeah. you, know, you start as a, as a resident in a hospital, and, and uh, you know, you've got to make a decision, am I going to do emergency medicine, or am I going to be a physician, or am I going to be a surgeon, or am I going to do psych, or, and, and so there's a, another fork, you know, and you've got to go, okay, well, I'm going to go down this path, you know, and, and surgery always appealed to me, because I just like that idea of, you know, something broken that you can fix and help people, you know. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're a hands-on sort of, you know, it broke, me fix kind of guy, that's that avenue appeals to you. So you end up taking that avenue and then there's, you know, various exams along the way and then you've got to make a decision, well, what sort of surgery are you going to do? And then and it just keeps dividing. And at the end, you find yourself a long way out on a limb of a tree very with a very narrow field. I mean, as you know, I only... You know, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon by training, but I only do upper limb surgery, and and you know, you end up down this very narrow path. It doesn't really let you do anything else. You are what you are, and uh, I'm sure if you knew all the steps involved when you started, probably no one would do it. They'd look at it and go, well, if I if I know it's going to take, you know, 15 years or 18 years, I'm going to have to do all these exams and this many nights of study. And if you if you knew what was in front of you at mm-hmm. the start, you probably wouldn't do it. Um, I don't think many people would choose to go down that path. They'd pick a different path. Because it's a series of forks in the road, mm. you keep picking the one that interests you and then you end up down a path at the end of it that, you know, doing something that you like doing because you, you've picked each pathway because you, you, it's the path that has the most enjoyment for you as you go. It's interesting because you, like, obviously we work with quite a few kids in schools and most of them... My, most of these kids, I mean, none of them know what to do, but it was interesting you saying from a very young age you sort of know which, knew, knew which way you wanted to go. Do, was there any pressure from your parents about being a doctor? You know how like there's be a doctor or be a lawyer, that sort of thing. Was there any, any no. from that from your parents or it was just do what you want? No, no, they, they didn't force me down any pathway. Um, they encouraged me, but, but they didn't, um, you know, there was certainly no pressure to do anything in particular. Um, it, it's, it's been an interesting experience for me because my kids are obviously getting that age now, and you, you know my three boys, yeah. and uh, um, it's, they're not so certain about what they want to do, 
And we certainly haven't put any pressure on them and I haven't encouraged them to go in any particular direction except what interests them. But uh, certainly, um, I don't think it's as clear for them as it was for me. Yeah. And so, and, and that's okay. They, they've just got to, you know, they'll work it out in time, what they want to do. So you were just following what made you curious and, and things yeah. that were fulfilling for you. And yeah, then you absolutely. ended up in this field where, yeah. you know, how many years ago you probably wouldn't have thought you'd be here. No, Is no, no. Right? So if, yeah. someone, if someone asked you 20 years ago, <coughs> are you going to operate on shoulders and elbows and wrists and hands, yeah. you'd say, oh, man, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just see where, where it takes me. Yeah. But uh, you, you just keep having to make decisions because the path you're on comes to a fork in the road. You've, mm. you've, to keep moving forward, you've got to go down an avenue, you know, of what to do. I'm, I'm sure if you actually saw a lot of athletes and, you know, you said to them, OK, over the course of your career you're going to have to do this much training and this many early starts and you're going to have 17 broken bones and five operations and a, yeah most of them probably wouldn't pick that path either but they do because they pick what they enjoy and earn no money <laughs> yeah you would yeah 100 well, percent. i remember my old man trying to talk me out of sport when when i was about 15 16 going into rugby league and he had bad knees and i'm like yeah but that's not me dad that's not mm. going to happen to me now, two new reconstructions <laughs> later. <laughs> like, I sort of wish I'd have listened, but anyway. Oh, you yeah. didn't? <laughs> no, I didn't. So what did school look like for you, Steve? You started at Churchy. You did your high school in Churchy. Did you play a bit of union there? Because I know you, you enjoy your union. Oh, yeah, played a little bit of sport, but I was, yep. I was probably, I guess by that stage, I was probably more academically yep. focused. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, I, I enjoyed the school. It was, it was you know, good years there. Um, one of my boys is there, as you know. Yeah. He's, he's enjoying it too. So, um, but uh, no, I think it was pretty standard, you know, high school and got through, played a little bit of sport and did the exams when you had to. I uh, probably didn't do as much study as I should have. That's interesting coming from a surgeon. Good memory, he reckons. <laughs> <laughs> Mind shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so then after after school, you went to uni, and do you want to tell us a bit about uni as well? Yeah, Queensland Uni, um, yep. to do medical degree, and that's it was an undergraduate degree then, so you went straight into it. It's postgrad there now, um, and uh, so you have to do. It's condensed. It's sort of like a three-year undergrad and then a four-year postgrad degree now. Whereas when I went, it was a six-year undergrad degree. So you went basically straight in with a cohort, and and I think, I think uni's probably got um, the the uni life's actually quite enjoyable, and and there's. There's, um, there's two things. You've got to learn and you've got to come out the other end with a degree. But you, it also teaches you how to be with people and network with people and interact with the world around you And because um, that's what you do in your life. Like you, you actually have to talk to people and ask them, can you do this? Or they ask you, can you do that? And, and you work together or you do favours for each other and... Um, you know, I, even today I'm constantly ringing other docs on the phone, you know, asking for advice about something or, you know, ringing a cardiologist saying, I've got to operate on this patient, he's on this drug, what should I do? How long before the op should we stop it? Or, you know, you, you're constantly bouncing questions off each other. And, and I think that's a big bit of what people got out of uni was actually having to go to campus every day, be with your cohort and learn how to interact with them. And I think, unfortunately, um, that's dying, and, and I noticed from from my eldest being at uni now, most of his courses are online. Even if he ticks, I want to do everything on campus. Most of his courses are online, um, and he's enjoying the subjects and he's enjoying the learning. But there's no interaction with his cohort, and he's he's missing out both professionally, learning how to deal with them, and he's also missing out, missing out on the social aspect of uni. You know, like mm. you know, Friday afternoon, going down having a you yeah, in a yeah, feed with your yeah. cohort and getting to know them and and even that extended over into you know the, the world has changed a bit I'm, I'm, I'm you know this is like me doing the LO in my day it was mm. better but even at the hospitals like when I graduated most hospitals had facilities where you would mingle you know they'd have a common room or a staff room they'd usually have some sort of makeshift bar on campus you know for a, a beer after work on Friday night or something like that so and, and you got to be colleagues. You didn't have to be good friends with everybody on staff, but you got to, you know, interact with them. And so 
the, the places work better because if you if you needed a favour, you could actually say, oh, mate, can you have a look at this patient for me? I'm a bit worried about them or whatever it might be. And and the answer is always yes in that, that environment. These days, you, you know, you, some of those hospitals are almost down to sending an email, you know, can you see this patient for me? Sorry, um, I was on yesterday, but I'm not on today now. I've read the email. You have to email someone else. And uh, it, 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 it's, it doesn't work quite the same. Because I think people are losing that half of the degree where you learn to interact with your peers yeah the interaction yeah i, I was just going to say when you said everything a lot of things are going online obviously while uh zach's at university you're going through that is was that brought on by COVID, or it was going that way anyway i think it was trickling that way and i think COVID just brought it on with a rush like he did most of his year 12 online because it was that year mm. COVID, the lockdown yeah. and then he did first year uni and it was all online and he even swapped unis to try and get more on campus and he went from UQ to QUT and 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 so they basically said look we're trying to take ours online as well so um, he, he does a few things out on campus but not much like a lot, so much was online and I, I think they're missing out I really do I think they're only actually getting half of what the uni experience used to be so, so if they're doing most of it online I'm just trying to get my head around what you're saying here are you think they're missing out they go straight from pretty much their bedroom doing everything online to straight into a working environment without that build up of interacting with their yeah, peers absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think and i think that's half of what you need that's to a big be. shock going straight into the workplace without yeah. that yeah and especially such an important workplace yeah and even workplaces these days huh? that so many employees are expecting oh can i do half the work you know, from home, you know, and, and, and mm. I, I think the whole system has moved. It's not just uni, but I don't think that's helped. I, I think um, certainly Zach, I think, feels like he's missing out. He's only getting half the experience of, of being at uni and he's certainly doing well. He's got good grades mm. and, he, you know, he's, he's going great and he enjoys what he's doing. But I, I, uh, I think that was only half of what uni was. And, and unfortunately, the other half's gone. So we, we had a great experience at uni, you know. Mm. It was just, you know, a big cohort. You all got to know each other. All, most of us are still... We don't see each other often, but you're still friends, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I hate to say it, we've got our 30-year reunion coming up soon, so that's going yep. to make me feel very old. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, everybody's still... You know, they're good mates, don't they? Cause they yeah, well, it's a networking opportunity too for you, right? Absolutely. Um, helping each other out and with business and... Yeah, referring people to each other. Yeah, I could imagine Zach would be missing out a lot. You don't want to do a whole uni degree at, in your room. You want to be out socialising. Yeah, you yeah. want to meet people. Well, Zach, yeah. Zach chose to be a labourer last year, didn't he? Well, he did. Yeah. He took uh, six months yeah. off because yeah. he was sick of sitting in his bedroom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so he worked... Uh, well, he, he did a bit of labouring, but he also worked um, with uh, TC, Troy Carroll, right, who yep. you guys know. And Troy, actually, I think you're having him on... Yep. Uh, on the podcast soon. Yeah, yeah. Sally's uh, going to organise that one. Yeah, so actually, it was talking to him on the weekend, but uh, so he runs a, a, a transport and logistics and warehousing business. So Zach went and worked with him for six months just to see the world and get out of his bedroom for a while. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you were talking about you went through the system, like you did your school system, university system, when was it that you thought? Like, were you ever going to be a GP? Was that totally out of the question when you went to uni, or was it, or were you? It was always more surgery. Yeah, and no, I think I always wanted to be more down that surgical pathway. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't. You don't really have to make that decision until you're out, sort of a couple of years out of mm. out of medicine about where you're going to go. But um, I don't. Uh, I think sort of certainly early on, I, I knew I wanted to do surgery. So that was that was one pathway I'd already sort of chosen but after that it was a bit of a you know, you so so did you have to do your six years at uni first and then you get to specialize in something or yeah. how does that work well yeah in those days it was six years at uni and then you did an intern year um which you know you're not actually technically completed your qualifications till you've done that first year in a hospital um and then usually around that stage you've got an idea what you want to do and you start studying so you have to do a usually a primary and whatever you want to do. So, so we had to do a surgical primary. So, so while I was doing a you know, second year as a resident in a hospital, you sit a surgical primary and then you try and get a job in a, in a surgical field somewhere, whatever you want to do. So for me, it was orthopaedics. So 
Um, you then do a non-training job, so basically so they can have a look at you. So you're not technically on the training program, but you're doing only orthopaedics. So I did that, for me it was two years. Might be one year, three years, two years, five years, whatever it takes you to get on. Um, so I did two years of that, and then you do a training program for four years, and then you have to sit exit exams for that, so your final exams. And then following that, most people then, if, if you want to then specialise further, you go and do what they call fellowships. So you, you're a um, postgraduate, but you, you go and um, join a unit somewhere in the world doing what you want to do, so shoulder surgery or knee surgery or hip surgery or whatever it might be. And, and um, you go and do that for a variable amount of time. I did three more years of that because I finished quite young. I was only 30 when I finished my orthopaedic training, so... You know, most people are a bit older than that, so so I was only 30. So I, I went and did another three years of, of hand surgery and microsurgery and elbow surgery and shoulder surgery and upper limb surgery. So um, and then came back to Brisbane, sort of oh, what it was, it would have been early 30s, and and um, set up practice. So yeah. So are you getting like? You're obviously getting paid towards the end of that, but was a lot of that unpaid work as well, like oh, uh, in the initial stages? Oh, your six years at uni is unpaid, but yeah. but um, most of us have part time jobs when you when you're going through. So what hour. were you doing part time oh, during that time? I used to work on the weekend as a phlebotomist, which is you know a blood collector, you know going yeah, around yeah, the, yeah. the wards and taking blood. And I used to work every holidays just doing labouring jobs, you know, carting rocks for landscapers and cleaning places, you know, at night, you know, you go in after everyone finishes, clean from, you know, dust till dawn type stuff, and yeah, um, right. I used to clean the gabber after matches oh, there, yeah. yeah, 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 I used to go and do that, and you'd be on the blowers blowing all the rubbish and things out, and I had heaps of different jobs, mo mostly just cleaning and labouring, yeah, the carrying rocks ones wasn't so great, you know, it was, <laughs> I used to just about <laughs> pity on the holidays, watch, so. watch your hands too, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Moving gas bottles, I had a job doing that on the holidays. That was in, and stamping them, you know, when they come in for, you know, they've been accredited and you put stamps and things on. But, them. but so uni it's for all you, physical labour. Yeah, yeah, but that would have been like a full time job, pretty much uni, wouldn't it? Like your yeah, study and stuff. Medicine certainly is because you've got a lot of contact hours. So, you know, some courses will have a fairly low contact hours, and then you work around that as flexible. Um, whereas medicine, a lot of it's just rote learning, so a lot of it was contact hours. So you'd be at uni 30 hours a week, so it was pretty much full time out there. So your jobs had to be nights and weekends, basically. Whereas some some of the other courses might have all their they might be able to get all their lectures into mm. Monday, Tuesday, and then be a bit more flexible about when they yeah. work and they can sort of push their you know study time around and things. So, mate, when you were in your your first placement like in a hospital did you work in like um the a and e wards or did you did you yeah. like see some crazy things early on as a young bloke oh yeah there's some there's some yeah there's all things that would shock <laughs> us <laughs> probably yeah yeah it's a bit, you get a bit of a rude shock when you get there but uh your first year is usually um they try to keep it really broad because people are trying to work out what they want to do mm. with their life so they try and give you an a and e term and a surgical term and a medical term and a few other, you know, things that you're interested in, they'll try and give you, if you say, oh, I'm interested in orthopedics, I'll try and give you an orthopedic term. Or, and, and so you, you do like a series of sort of 10 week or sometimes they're in five week allotments and, and they'll usually, um, second year they'll send you country relieving. So there's a lot of country hospitals don't have regular docs, they just have rotating residents that go out there and fill in because um, they can't get a permanent person. Did you so, have to do that? Yeah, I went to, uh, I was sent to Baralabar for a period of time don't out there. So I don't even know where that is. Oh, uh, you sort of rocky and turn west oh, yeah. for a few yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, so. In the sticks. In the sticks, yeah. So that was, uh, it was really interesting. I was studying for my exams when I was out there, so it was a really quiet job. Mm. Uh, and, and they used to try and, they do try and look after you, and yeah. certainly did in those days. So they sent me there because they knew I was studying. It was a nice, quiet job, and you could do a few hours work a day, and sort everything out and you know you'd get weird things like you know you, you lived in this little cottage next to the hospital and the, you know there'd be someone knocking on the window at 3am in the morning and you'd open up the window and they'd go doc I've lost my gout pills <laughs> and you'd just go oh god can you, can you come back in a few hours yeah, yeah. nah oh, oh, okay we'll get the script book out and you'd, you know give them a script for some more gout tablets or whatever it was but uh, gout 
Do you know anyone that's got ja- gout, Jacko? No. Mate, mate, that's supposed to be super painful, isn't it? In the oh, acute gout is, yeah. Terrible. Yeah. yeah, and that's probably why they knock on the door at three. <laughs> what, actually, <laughs> what actually is it? Uh, it's when you, you, you're getting um, deposits of um, monosodium urate crystals. See, they're basically urate crystals depositing in your tissues that shouldn't be there. And it's, it's usually when you either don't have adequate enzymes to deal with the protein that you're metabolising or you overwhelm those and so you, you don't fully break down um, the proteins and you get this increase in urate crystals and they get deposited out. It's usually in the coldest part of your body. It's, you know, where they crystallise that. So it's often your big toe or yeah. something like that. And it hurts. I mean, you've got all these little... It'd be like having little ice crystals or something fall in, form in your tissues. Well, they've got little urate crystals forming. It's, yeah. Yeah, I, won't, no. I won't lie to you, Steve. I don't know what any of that meant. <laughs> <laughs> that all went over my head. So a big toe is the yeah, thing yeah, at the your end big of your toe leg. gets sore, really <laughs> cold. <laughs> really sore big toe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I That's where this, my head goes. I knew a bloke on, on the building side. He always used to complain about his gout. He was a, a pretty heavy drinker and he said, oh, this, this fires it up. But then I've heard other people say like shellfish, uh, prawns and things like that fire it up. Is that, big, is that big, right? Big yeah? protein, yeah. Oh, if, you, if you overwhelm your ability to deal with the protein you're adding, say, you know, a big day on the beer and prawns yeah, will often yeah. do it. Um, there, there, there's some ethnic groups in, in, in society. Like um, a, a lot of Polynesians don't have as much of the enzyme that you need to break down the... the oh, right. Oh, so true. they're a bit prone to get it. They, they have a lower threshold for getting it and things. So, you know, there can be a genetic component to it in that, in that factor as well. So, But usually if you just eat more protein than your body can deal with on that day. So if you, if you have a big day on the beer and prawns, we'll, we'll do it to you. Yeah, right. Why are you up? Oh, jeez. Young? Yeah, yeah. I just want to know. So, like, after you did, was it your fellowship that you finished with before you could become yeah. a surgeon? Well, was look, it? Look, once you've once you've finished your training program, so you've done your so your, your pre-trained job, you've got a training position, you do your four years of training, and you sit your final exams. You you can go and start work as an orthopedic surgeon, or you can go and do um, more training in a narrower field and that's what a lot of us go and do we, yeah. we say okay well you know for me i didn't want to do any more lower limb or back surgery or i just said okay well i'm gonna do upper limb so I, I went and spent another three years doing you know hand surgery micro surgery um elbow surgery shoulder surgery so and that's all i do now if yeah. i jump in there so you had options at that oh. stage and you went to upper limb because of why um, it's probably, I, I, for me, there's more variety in upper limb. Mm. Like, uh, you know, a lot of, um, that, that was what appealed to it with me. I mean, I'm, you know, other guys like knees, they like hips, whatever. But for me, if you look at my work, say, workload over a month or something, you know, the number of operations we do, there's very few of them replicated. You know, we might do, a, you know, there's um, lots of different procedures we do. Mm. Whereas some of the other specialties, it's a lot narrower than that in that they'll just do the one or two procedures over and over and over and over again. Yeah. So for me, that, that was appealing because um, it's a long career. You don't particularly want to get bored with it. So mm. it's good if you've got some more variety in there. So so, so what's your, now your upper limb, What what's the most common thing that comes in? Uh, it's I actually looked at that recently. Yeah. At the moment, our most common operation is shoulder stabilisation. So yeah. for unstable shoulders for and that, and that's athletes it, it's uh, you know might be guys have just been you know amateur sportsmen mm. had had you know dislocation at some stage um we get a lot of um, defense force so i see a lot of defense force members that have had unstable shoulders. shoulders yeah it's common um so yeah we, we do is do that it. is that just would that be through their training or like oh, hitting well the ground, that sort of stuff. They're, and they're, they're physical guys generally. That you mm. know, by guys. I don't just mean blokes. I mean guys and girls. Yeah, but yeah, they're, yeah. They're, You know, they're, the people that go into that line of um, career, they're, they're, they're physical and they yeah. and they want to stay physical and they play sports when they're not training. They also, I think, in the military, they um, it's not not unlike being an athlete in that they try to train them under fatigue. You know, in in mm. you know in, in replicator. Uh, a combat situation, you know, where you're not you're not running out fresh onto the battlefield. You know, mm. you, you 
they, they fatigue them first. They deliberately send them for, a, you know, some sort of exhausting exercise, you know, whether it be a pack run or a... And sleep uh, deprivation. Know, or, or whatever it might mm. be, yeah. And then they put them through an exercise that they're meant to be doing or grappling or... So they're constantly exercising and, and stressing their bodies under fatigue and but sometimes they break. It's, not, it's, uh, it's probably no different to being a, uh, an athlete. You know, in that respect, like you, you know, you're on the footy field. Most of the injuries are in the, you know, the last ten minutes of the, the yeah. half. Yeah, right. And yeah. and, and that, that's where they try to put themselves all the time is in the last ten minutes of the half, and and have you know them exercising at fatigue when they're exhausted, mm. and, and that's when things break. So we do see a lot of a uh, lot of guys from the military with, um, especially subluxing shoulders. Like that's common. I'd say athletes would be. Athletes, military would be quite high up there, both both of them as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I suppose, what else have you got? Workplace injuries as, as well? Yeah, we see lots of workplace injuries, you know, people putting you know, nail guns through hands and yeah. you know, crushing <laughs> fingertips and all those sorts of things. Um, we, we treat a pretty diverse lot of athletes too. I mean, I've never really, you know, you probably know from, you know, people you've met through mm. my sort of, they we haven't really narrowed down and tried to just do footy players or, you know, mm. I do treat a lot of the motorsport guys, so we get a lot of motorbike riders through. But oh, they'll keep you busy, won't they? They do, they <laughs> do. Yeah, they're a, nice, they're a nice group of guys, but they keep us busy. Mm. Um, but, you know, we treat boxers and bull riders and um, archers and, you know, they're often bringing us in, you know, various bits of thank you and, you know, you've probably seen all the bits stuck on our walls. And yeah. Work. Well, yeah. Well, I met you guys through a mutual friend who was a bike rider, Kenny Hamer. Yeah. And uh, I think, oh, obviously it was many years ago and Kenny introduced us, us together and, um, mate, Kenny was always, always, <laughs> he just, every time I saw him, he was in a sling coming yeah. off his bike for one reason or another. Yeah, he'd had a few injuries. Yeah. So had his boy. <laughs> yeah, Kenny yeah, Jr. the other, yeah. other Ken, yeah. 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 Actually, I, I, I bumped into Kenny Senior at uh, down the coast a couple of nights ago. Good guy. Hadn't seen him for ages. Yeah. So, yeah, said g'day and caught up briefly. Yeah. yeah, like you said, well, when you walk into your practice, it's just like memorabilia galore. There's boxing gloves, there's, well, th I think there's a bull rider strap, there's a defence force, um, like signed memorabilia thing. There's so many different people and you've treated them all. Yeah. Yeah, so diverse. Well, yeah. it keeps us interested too because, you know, at oh, the end of the day, you, yeah. you're trying to get to know these people, get an idea feel for you know, what their goals are and are you going to be able to get them back to it. So you need an idea of what they're like and, um, you know, so it's, it's it, that's the enjoyable part of my job is actually meeting these people and, and um, you know, so so having a really diverse group like that is fantastic. I, yeah. You know, first thing I usually ask people is, yeah, what do you do and, you know, yeah. Yeah, what do you want to do moving forward and when do you, especially when athletes come in, one of the first questions I usually ask them is, what are you trying to be ready for? You know, yes, mm. you've got this injury, but what do you want to be back for? And they'll say, oh, I want to... If it's the motorbike riders, you say, I want to ride this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, but I feel like as being a patient of yours as well, um, I've felt you feel that when you walk into the practice, like all the people are... Uh, there's a culture for that. You all make sure you feel cared for. And and as soon as you sit down with yourself, like you said, you, what are, what are we looking forward to? And then you just make it happen and make it realistic if it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Yeah. And then you can work off that, especially as an athlete, because you want the best result as quickly as possible. But sometimes you need yourself to say, that's not going to happen, but no. this is what we're going to do. No, yeah. absolutely. Like sometimes people say, oh, I want to be back for this. And you just say, look, that ain't going to happen. Mm. Um, you need this surgery. You're not going to be back for six weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever it is. What's your next event? You know, so and, yeah. and how do we, how do we make this work for you? Do I need to talk to the, you know, the race safe or you know the organisers, or do I need to chat to your promoter or yeah. whoever it is? You know, and 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 look, most of the time you can you can make it work for patients. You get something that gets them back and competing, and yeah. So yeah. I'm sure you've had to break some hearts as well, like tell them the the raw truth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That, that's always got to be tough. Uh, I I think. Yeah, most of the time I think patients know. You know, like deep down they know. Yeah. You know, you're just telling them what they already realise that, but you know, that they, it's, it's... They don't want to hear it, but... They don't want to hear it, but, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, they know. They know it's over. 
Mm. Yeah, right. So the neck, I suppose, as well as your surgery, you've also got more more things going on. You've got um, rig. Am I pronouncing it right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, we're we're in the process of trying to um, um, do some product development, mm. and, and 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 that's on a on a. Um, few levels you know and that we're, we're trying to do some stuff ourselves like rig you know where we're trying to make some better products for athletes um and and that obviously um, that's a big learning curve for us because that's not what we do um mm. we know what works at the back end but the process of getting there um is something that uh you know we're learning as we go and we get a lot of help from wayne he's actually just walked through the door <laughs> um just good, by good timing how about that for timing <laughs> and uh so that's a, an interesting experience. We're, we're also doing work with um, prosthetic companies, helping mm. them develop products, evaluate products, design new products. Um, and, and I've got arrangements with a couple of the, the um, companies now that we're, we're helping them research, um, particularly um, some of the newer biological type things, you know. So um, one of the things I do a lot of that a lot of people don't do is, is, is some of this um, work with the new biologic implants, you know, so one of those being um, autologous tenocide implantation, you know, so we work with a company called um, OrthoCell who are based in Perth and um, essentially what they do is um, grow human tissue and, and human cells, so, mm -hmm. so we use it a lot for, um, say, tennis elbow. Um, that's probably its, its biggest target market at the that'd moment. Be, so be common for you, wouldn't it? Tennis elbow. Well, it's it's common for me, and it's particularly common because I'm one of the few guys around that is involved with ATI with OrthoCell. Um, and so what happens is that if you've got intractable tendinopathy, so te tennis elbow isn't an inflamed tendon; it's a degenerate tendon. So it's a tendon that's not repairing itself. And so if you cut into a tendon that's got tendinosis or tendinopathy, like a um, tennis elbow tendon, when you incise into the tendon, um, the outside doesn't look too bad and the inside just looks like a gooey mess. It's just all this degenerate, mushy, it's almost like jello on the mm. inside. And obviously if you get enough of that jello in there, the, the tendon's got no structural integrity and it just starts to come apart. So you often have a decent tendon on the outside and then this gelatinous area on the inside with a hole in the middle of it and that, and that tendon's falling apart and not repairing itself. So there's things you can do to try and help uh, with the pain, but if you're gonna try and help that tendon heal, you need to create an environment of healing in there. And so you can either do that by inflicting some trauma onto the tendon, you know, either by needling it or injecting blood products into it or operating on it and, and scraping out and drilling holes through it uh, and into the bone to try and make it more like an acute tear so it'll heal itself or you can actually try and replenish the cells that have been lost out of the tendon so it's not healing itself. So the way you do that is you harvest a little piece of tendon, you send it to the lab in Perth with OrthoCell and they, um, they, they grow the cells, test them, make sure they're actually producing good type one collagen and then they send them back. They send us a little jar with about 10 to 15 million of your tendon cells in it. Yeah, wow. And so we, we send you downstairs, you get an ultrasound they find the really mushy bit of tendon with the hole in it, they draw up the cells and they inject it in there and hopefully most of them survive and actually start repairing the tendon for you. And if you watch them with serial MRIs, you can actually see the hole in the tendon fill in over time and, the, and as it fills in, your symptoms slowly get better. So so, so how long is that process from, from, well, from harvest, to build the cell? For, yeah. To build the cells takes about six weeks yep. and for the tendon to heal and fill in takes the best part of six months, which is, say... Uh, they've got about an 85% recovery rate at six months, which is pretty good because this is an intractable group of patients generally that aren't getting better with anything mm. else. So the results are actually pretty good. So, and, and, and we're working with OrthoCell at the moment to do some research on it and try to show how, um, you know, how much you actually uh, save in time off and in costs and by actually treating people earlier with this. Uh, uh, is this just in Australia or are they doing this worldwide? Oh, they're trying to take it worldwide. It's, interestingly, with this sort of technology, Australia actually pretty much leads the world at the moment. Yeah, so right. it's, um, they would love to prove how well it works and then sell the technology to everywhere. Yeah. And then when that's, I'm sure that's their goal yeah. um, to do it. But uh, it, they need more data yet. So, um, But uh, it's, working. it's working well. And it's something we're involved with a lot. Um, 
and, and we're doing some similar research or just starting similar research project with another biological product, um, which is like a, um, a, a collagen sponge almost. They call it a graft, but it's, mm. it's like, um, it almost looks like cotton wool, but it's made out of human, or it's type one collagen. They actually get it from cows, so bovine, or you can get it from pigs. Some of the brands make 14 ones. The ones we're working with are um, bovine, and you can use those to um, attach to the outside of healing tendons to try and you know, uh, create a, a, an environment where it can actually incorporate and heal and, and, and repair the tendon and thicken it up. And that's a thing called a Regenitin patch. Uh, as I said, there's more than one product out there, but that's that's sort of the leading product at the moment. Oh, that's, that's the leading product, yeah. Well, right. only that's got, um, it, you know, it's got the runs on the board, it works really well, and they've got a great application system for it. So that's really where, um, you know, a lot of it's going at the moment. So they're, they're, they're out in front at the moment with that sort of product. So, and, and, that's, and that's something we've started doing some research with them as well, trying to um, basically show that you can get better faster if you actually try and improve the quality of the tendon, you know, so. Is that, you know, people talk about, again, layman's terms here, <laughs> people talk about tennis elbow, um, golfer's elbow, do they, is that what they say? That's you, what I got. You, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not good enough to have a golfer's elbow. Oh, I almost do from holding pads from your, for your boys. <laughs> you get like this all the time. What's the difference? Oh, look, it's, it's actually the same process. It's mm. that tendinosis, you know, gooey, degenerate tendon. It's just in different parts of the body. Your, your, your tennis elbow is in your... Oh, so it's not exactly the same thing. It is in a different part of your elbow. Same, same yeah. pathology, different yeah. tendon. Right. Yeah, so yeah. your tennis elbow is on the, on the outside of your elbow yeah. um, in your common extensor origin. Your golfer's elbow is when you get it on the inside on your common flexor origin. And so it's the same process, but just the opposite side of the elbow. So. If you could hit a golf ball, that's where you'd get a bit of pain. Unfortunately, you can't get it off the mat, mate. I can't get it off the turf. <laughs> mate. <laughs> mate, I'll get uh I'll get Boxer's shoulder in a minute when oh. I when I <laughs> when I put one on your chin. <laughs> so you've seen a few boxers, obviously. Um I don't know if you're entitled to mention any names and I'm not gonna ask you, but uh well, out of boxers, what's the most common injury you, you've oh, seen? I think I think there's actually four common things I see in boxers. Mm. Um you know, you, you get the typical boxers knuckle and, and look everyone would have heard of there's been a few well-known Australian boxers have boxers knuckles. Can recently. you actually explain that to us? What it what it actually is? Yeah, it, look, it's when you, you you're striking on the 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 point of your knuckle, and you dislodge the extensor tendon that should run over the back of the of the knuckle. The so second yeah. knuckle there. Oh well, it, it can happen to any of them. All right. Yep. Um, yeah. But yes, it's often the second in in boxers because that's where they should be yep. striking. Um, and, and so you, any time you've got a tendon tracking over a joint it has to have something to stabilise the tendon. Whether it be on the front, you've got to have some sort of arrangement to hold the tendon against the bone, or if it's on the back of a knuckle like that, you've got to have something to help it track centrally, because otherwise it'd just fall off to the side all yep. the time. So like your kneecap, you know, you, your kneecap's there to help your quads tendon track over the front of your, yep. your knee and not fall off to the side. Well, on the back of your knuckle, you've got a tendon, but then you've got a, um, what's called an extensor hood. So you've got a series of, uh, like a band of tissue that comes up either side and and helps hold that tendon in place. And then your your little muscles in your hand will come in and insert into that as well. So you've got this quite complex structure over the back. Well, if you, if you hit hard enough on that tendon, you can dislodge the tendon. You can either split the hood and then the tendon falls off to the side or the hood can stay there and you can actually peel the tendon off the hood so it actually falls off without the hood moving but either way the tendon doesn't then track over the back of the knuckle yeah. like it should and so if you if you do it badly enough you, you you can't actually extend the finger because the tendon's fallen down to the side of the knuckle you can push your finger up oh, and then you can hold happens? it there yeah, right. but if you be, make a fist and then try and bring it up it won't come up because it's down the side that's if you do it completely yeah. Yeah. sometimes boxer knuckles are only partial you've only just dislodged it slightly but yeah, they need to be repaired and tacked back onto that hood so that they'll actually track properly and stay there. So there's been there's been a couple of um, you know well-known Aussie boxers mm. have have had uh, reconstructions for that recently. Um, so that's that's a common one in boxers. Injuries through your carpometacarpal joints is common. That's Jacko's. That's Jacko. Yeah. 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 
um, where you've just mistimed a punch and, and you've flexed between the long bones in your hand and the little bones in your wrist and the joint across there opens up at the back and that might involve a little fracture or it might just be a tear of the ligaments there. But that's a common injury mm -hmm. to injure those joints and we've, we've fixed a few of those in boxes recently. Mm -hmm. um, you can often, if, it's, if they're just sore, you can sometimes get them to settle with some steroid. Um, if, if they keep giving problems, often what you have to do is fuse that knuckle. So actually, yeah. you know, join the two bones uh, together with a bit of bone graft and a little uh, plate or a pin or... I believe when I first did it, I had the fracture. That's why I got it operated to scrape that out too. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we've taken a bit of bone off the back, but at some point if that joint keeps giving you problems, yeah. well, yeah, we'll fuse it at some point. So, mm. um, and, and so they're probably the two most common hand injuries we see. Um, elbows, a lot of boxers seem to get arthritic spurs and things in their elbows. Interestingly, often on the fronts of their elbows, most people seem to have more trouble at the back athletes. Like we, we mm. clean a lot of the back of um, elbow joints out where they've got bone jamming on bone in yeah. extension or they can't fully extend. Boxers seem to have equally as much problem the other way and I suspect that's because they're taking or punches defending, this way all the time, punches, yeah. catching Locking. punches and they often get spurs in the front of their elbow and you've got to go in and grind those off so that they can actually not, they can bend their elbow or, or let it be bent without bone jamming on bone and getting pain. So yeah. that's oh, not We're on video and they can see me doing this. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to do the motions. So that's uh, not uncommon. And and, and the, the last one's probably shoulder instability and, and mm. or either acute, you know, where they've got an unstable shoulder that's coming out or feels like it's going to, or you're seeing them down the track with one that's been unstable for a long time and they've put up with it and the shoulder's pretty arthritic. Mm. So, to be honest, and as you know, out of dealing with a few boxes, too many boxes, they generally lack a good warm-up. It's just, I don't know, been stupid habits they've got used to over years. They don't sort of... What would you... To look after... To, so, a boxer, obviously, you're upper limb, so any part of the, the... From the fingertip to the shoulder in a boxer can go... What would you say a good warm up should be? Should consist of, and should you do anything after training? Like, should would you say you should ice your hands after every training session, or or oh, any tips from you? See, look, certainly if you've got a problem, yeah, I, mm. ice them down, mm. and then you know the best thing to do is warm up before, and you know, so light stretch and warm everything up. You know, so if that involves you're putting a heat pack on it or going for a light exercise or something. But you've got to get warm before you do it. So light stretch and warm up before. And then if any problem areas, ice them down and, and get, them, get them cool afterwards. And, and, and it'll help you um, recover quicker. So that, you know, if, you, if you're recovering quicker, you can train more often. You can train more often. You're going to beat the other guy, aren't you? That's you right. Know, yeah. So you've got to, um, if, you, if you're smart about it and you're, warm up and cool down properly then you'll 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 be able to train more efficiently mm. and, well, you're, and you're probably less likely to get injuries there's not necessarily a lot of hard evidence on that but um, certainly if you stretch do a light warm up and a stretch beforehand yes you, you, you you're more likely to to be able to participate well and not and not injure yourself but then if you cool down afterwards really what you're doing is trying to um, prevent the the the, um, the swelling and the and the problems that'll stop you from doing the same routine the next mm. day so yeah warm what, up what ice down the, after uh, yeah. sorry steve but what about like some of the old school like hand conditioning ex exercises you see like putting your hands in buckets and squeezing or you know punching hard things on the ground to toughen your knuckles Is anything any like s evidence backed into things like that or not really no nah. No, is, is I don't think there's any evidence for it. I, I yeah. think that's probably more... I think that's mind games. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like you're yeah, actually yeah. building mental toughness, mm. not... And there's, oh, there's got to be other ways to do that than, than, you know, smashing your knuckles on the ground and and right. and, and shortening your career because you've had three boxes knuckles and... Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah you know true. What I mean? Like, I, yeah. I, I, I can see why they do it, but there's got to be better ways of building mental toughness than than damaging your body while you're doing it. You know, you can be smarter about it than that now. Mate, when you said when you mentioned icing, so you know you've got a a hand 
you've had you've had a training session. Um, it's sort of sore, but it's it's like not getting any worse. How quickly did you get your ice on it? As soon as you straight finished? Away. Yeah, yeah, straight away. How long? Oh, 20 minutes, 20, 30 mm. minutes, yeah. yeah. And then and then you can do it in cycles. You know, you can ice them for 20, have them out for 20, ice them for 20, out for 20, ice them for 20, and just, and just get, you know, minimal swelling, get your recovery process going better, you know. Could, could um, low dose anti-inflammatories can help when you're really mm. having a problem, yeah. you know. So it's all part of just managing managing the, the issue rather than ignoring it and just mm. letting it get more sore and being able to do less and less training as you go along. How, again, like everybody hears things, but they're not, they don't have the, uh, uh, somebody like the wisdom of yourself. Like how often do they need to ice? Like, so if, if you finish training at 7.30 at night, yeah. how often oh. do you want to be, is it as often as you possibly no, no, can? I, or is I, it? I think if you've got a known injury and you've got something that's problematic, you want to go home and be icing it on and off, you know, like 20 minute cycles, yeah, right. ideally, and keep doing it, keep doing it for 48 hours, you know, and, and um, if you've got a, an injury, if you're just sore, you know, you've had a big workout and you've come off sore and you, your hands are a bit swollen or, you, you know, whatever it might be, um, just, just get the ice on them straight away, even if it's just for the one 20 minute stretch, but just get them cool quickly and then uh, you, you'll have less swelling, it'll be easier to get them going the next morning and get back into it. So it's all it's all about recovery time. I mean, you know, that's what what um, you know. It's not, if you're exercising every day, you should try to get ready for a fight, or you know, you know you're in that ramp up mode. You got to look after things, or or you know, you you just can't ramp the training up. You know, so you, the way you do that is by looking after things. So mm. post session, ice yourself down, get yourself cool. You know, the the I suppose the reason I ask that is because so many people like I'm I'm probably saying ninety five percent percent of people that need icing oh yeah i'll do it when i get home have you missed some vital minutes there like if you're not depends doing it where, immediately because you live probably but yeah, no, it's yeah. better if you do it at the time yeah the ideal thing would be to come off here and jam them in you know have, well, we, have, have, we've have got it. the ice machine mate yeah they should be using it yeah they're, they're not not nights where you just do an exercise but if you've been out here and you've been you know sparring for eight rounds or you've been over on the heavy bags yeah, hitting yeah. them hard or doing lots of pad work or you come off, your, your hands are sore when you unwrap your mm. wraps, get them in the ice. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Let them, get them recovered. That way you can do it again tomorrow. Mm. Would you, would you, I suppose we've never done this, but would you um, think for a boxer's hand, what should you be looking at when you wrap your hands? You know, when you, we've got tape and bandage we can use. Would you, just to keep safety over a boxer's hand, like you said, what, what's this one called again? The one that Jack had? Your carpal metacarpal joints. Yeah. yeah across here. Yeah. Ha, would there be a special way of bandaging, taping over that? Or would you just, because generally what we do, we start around the wrist and we crisscross over the back over, over the back, and then build the knuckle and put a knuckle pad in around the thumb and then we just generally secure it all. Would there be a special way? Are you just trying to, eliminate any movement in the in that wrist i think you're just trying to give it as much support as you can mm. so that it, it so that it's taking less of the load you know if you yeah. if you do miss q one and you and you, there's a flexion force there that yeah. some of that's being taken up by the tape um as far as on the end you know with padding and things yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question it'd be a mm. good study yeah because mm. yeah, I, I find i only like i do all that but i only tape it when i've got sparring because I feel like even if I'm hitting... Tape over your wraps, you mean? Yeah, tape over my wraps and under. But I don't feel... Because when I initially did it, I it was like from an unpredictable movement of my opponent when I was sparring. But when I'm hitting pads and stuff, I feel like I'm in control and I don't have many where it goes. It kinks out or it's anything. It's when somebody moves in it's a different way. It's when I'm hitting someone and their head moves or, or I throw an uppercut and it feels weird and something moves and then uh, it just gets disjointed or something yeah it's, it's probably the same with most injuries isn't mm -hmm. it if, you, if you're in total control and it's just you yeah like the bag it, and it stuff it usually requires mm. something weird you know like um like at a car's foot getting caught in the turf oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah when was that friday night mm. sunday night mm. yeah so you know it requires something unpredictable to happen mm. and if it's just you that rarely happens but it can like that yeah. but but usually the the opponent isn't it the you know mm. the 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 you know, the hip drop onto the back of your foot, yeah, yeah. pinning your ankle or the, 
or the you know you, the, the opponent moving and you you don't catch him flush and you yeah. the forces are different across that joint so mm. and that's a hard thing to to prevent you know you can try you know you can that's why you tape it you're trying to prevent it but mm. you're not going to prevent all of them what, what was your first let, let's move away from boxing for a minute but what was your first experience like when you actually had to go into surgery and you were the main operator on someone what'd that feel like what yeah run oh. us through that you don't, you don't really get left. Um, if you go back a little bit, like I'll go from it from the reverse end. Yep. You know, I don't do a lot of teaching at the moment because um, I've recently left the public again. I went back for a while during COVID to help out, and I've just gone. But when you're doing teaching, um, it's generally um, pretty controlled. Like if you're te teaching, say the more senior guys something you know you'll say okay what is it you want to learn and i'll say oh, i want to learn how to do this procedure because not many people do it you do lots of them so okay well come over to the private you can help me do one and then you can book a couple at the public and the first one they do you might stand right next to them while they do it and, and go no no it needs to go there and you just show them a little bit and then the next one you might sit in the corner of the theater and just kind of hover and the third one you might sit in the tea room and and say so you're there and you might just make your head in the door a couple of times and say you're right you know and you, 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 so and 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 when you're learning it from the other side you watch one done and then this first one you do you might struggle a little bit in that you you know you just can't work out exactly how that you did one of the steps or you know and then and that's where you then learn you can really take and say how did how do you do that and you go well you do it this way and you show them and then they pick it up and so it's quite a controlled situation, you know, yeah. and you're not, you don't, you don't try to throw people in the deep end. And and when you're very first starting, you're junior and you're learning, it's very much the same. Like the first time you do an operation, it might be something really simple, you know, where you've got to put a few stitches in, and and the, you know the registrar will say to you, yeah, you're right, yeah, we go, and you know you put it in, and they show you, no, you're not holding that properly, you're not doing that properly. And then you might get to a point in a few weeks ago, look, he's actually doing that pretty well. I'll step out for this one and let him do it on his own. It might be a carpal tunnel or trigger finger or something simple. And, you know, and so it's usually, um, at those settings, it's usually pretty controlled. Little baby uh, steps until it, you're it, ready. It, yeah, at the beginning. And then, and then when you get like a training registrar job, um, the way it's meant to work very much is that You'll often be on your own, but if there's something there that you're not comfortable with, there should always be someone you can call mm. to come and help, you know, whether it's a more senior registrar or a consultant on call or a fellow, or there'll be somebody up the chain that you should be able to ring and say, um, I've got to take this patient to theatre urgently and, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that on my own. Can you come? So there should always be somebody available. Mm. So I'm, I'm sure you would have had a few nervous moments though oh you, look you just do. what's going on here this is not this is not what i read about or yeah look that 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 can happen and you've always got to then just work out how you're going to get you know how you're going to make it right mm. and how you can fix that and that's probably no different to a lot of jobs where you fix things you know i'm sure mechanics have things like that all the time where they fix something and they turn the can still doesn't run they go oh god i thought i did everything right yeah. but it's still not ticking over and you just got to go back to basics and you know, try and work out what's not working and why and try and find out and, you know, find another way of doing it. I mean, um, I I even now, like, there'll be some days when, uh, if I've got, you know, a big surgery coming up on the Monday or, you know, I might just spend time on the Sunday just thinking about what you're going to do because it's not that you're worried about it as such, it's just that you know it's a big deal and it's a big thing and it's going to take, you know, a five-hour operation. You think through your head, OK, I'm going to do A, B, C, D and E. If that doesn't work, we're going to do this. And my fallback's going to be this if we've got a, got a problem. Is it, so is it that you prepare so well that you don't ever get really overwhelmed by things? Uh, yeah, probably. I think if you, if you prepare, and, and that's even down to ordering equipment. You know, if you actually plan for all the things to go wrong and you've got all the equipment there to deal with it, you rarely need it. Yeah. You know, but whereas if you don't and you need it, then you're in trouble. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, and so you've just got to think about it and make sure you've, in your head, planned for all the potential problems mm. that you might encounter. And if you do that, yeah, usually usually things run very smoothly. Mate, if you weren't a surgeon, what would you be? What do you love? What do you love doing apart from what you're doing? Oh, 
Yeah, look, I don't know. I think I think I actually picked a good job for me. Like I'm actually like I'm good at what I do and I enjoy what I do and it and it fits, you know, my skill set. You know, I'm good at fixing things. Um, and 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 I and I enjoy helping people. So in that respect it's good. If I was gonna do anything any different from what I've done, um, potentially something a bit more um, I, I sometimes think I wouldn't have been about architects, you know, because mm. I like the precision of it, but also, you know, what we probably lack a bit is the creative side, and you can you probably get a bit of both in yeah. some of that. So, and and you know, a role like that, I think I would have enjoyed. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe architect. I don't know, but but I like what I do. No, so. that's what. And the kids, how the, the kids are going well? Like Zach's obviously at university now. Yeah. Um, what Ben's in grade eleven? Ben, Ben's in year eleven. Yeah. And then Will grade. Nine, nine, yeah, nine, and they, they're all nine. doing good. We're still playing football. All the kids are still involved yeah. in sport and yeah. boxing, bit of yeah. everything, bit of boxing and and uh, yeah, bit of rugby and yeah, they were, they were having a good time. So. Tennis occasionally. Yeah, the odd tennis match. Yeah. At home. <laughs> the odd t- I think that's more Sally than the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Very competitive. Right, Steve's not a bad tennis player right, himself. Right, you you got to go go karting with Sally, mate. <laughs> She'll bump you off the track, mate. Yeah. So, like, mate, it's like Mario Kart. Oh, mate. <laughs> I'm telling you, Amira was crying. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't because of Sal, though. <laughs> but, mate, Sal's um, obviously a big part of, well, she's your wife, but also your business as well. Oh, um, like. She seems to, would I be right in saying she runs the ship in the office there? Oh, absolutely. It's like any business. You've got to, you've got to work in the business and on the business. And, and I spend that much time working in the business I, I have very little time to spend working on the business and making it run well. And um, you couldn't see the volume of work that we do. And I say we, because it's a we. Like you couldn't actually get it through and, and treat it well unless I had the right help, you know. And, and, um, uh, and that goes across all the staff, but, but especially Sal, but, but everybody. If it, if it, I didn't have them, I couldn't, I could probably only see half as many people as I do, you know, because I'd have to spend a lot of time working on the business, not just in the business. So mm. I think in that respect, we work really well together. I mean, um, you know, Sal, Sal obviously does a lot of organising, and, and that's not only the practice and making it run well, but also a lot of the patients actually just ring Sal, you know, once they've been patients and they, they know her. And, like, it's not uncommon for Sal to get a phone call from, say, one of the, the motocross riders saying, oh, Sal, I've had an accident. And she said, oh, well, where, you know, where are you thinking, meaning what hospital are you at? And they say, oh, I'm on turn four. <laughs> <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and they're still out on the track with the ambulance yeah. retrieving them, you know. And, and uh, she said, well, look, you know, Get to the nearest hospital, get an X-ray, send it through. We'll sort it out, you know. And and um, so so sales role it goes beyond just running the practice, but uh, and, and it works really well. Like we we you know as I said, I, I I we would be lucky to be able to deal with half the number of patients we deal with. Um, probably couldn't even do that if if I didn't have the team of people around me to help that I do, and especially Sal and Sam um, that that really run the ship. But uh, um, you, you just got to have the right people. I mean, that, and that's at, a, at every level. Like, you've got to get the right team in theatre as well. You know, if you haven't got staff that you know well and know you and you trust that they know what they're doing and suddenly it turns a very easy day into a very long, difficult day. And so if you get, you know, the right staff and the right equipment and the right people and all the right organisation, then you can actually work really efficiently. You can do a great job, and, but you can also do it smoothly and quickly. And they yeah. know how you work and, and what you want yeah, and, next and, what and a step ahead. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rather than every time you turn around and say, oh, I need a... Yeah. And they have to it's run the down to the other end of the theatre complex for it. Yeah. You know, mo- most of the scrub nurses that I work with, like when I turn around, before I say what I need, they actually put it in my hand. I go, yeah. Excellent. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, because they're watching, they know what you do next. Are they your team? Are they? Are you work with the same people every day or...? No, but it's a it's a small, hopefully small group of yeah. people. Yeah. You, if you... It's, it's often, uh, to have the same people all the time is sometimes hard too because if they're away, then no one knows what you mm. want. Yeah. Um, so what you really want is a small group of really good staff that know what you, that, that know what you like. And, and we're, we're 
pretty much there now. We've, it's uh, it's working very well. So, you know. Speaking of long, difficult days, I know you've spoke in the past um, about, you know, some of the shifts you've done with no breaks, you know, like operating. What's what's the longest time you've spent at an operating table just in one sitting? Uh long time ago, yeah. 8, 8 a.m. Saturday morning to 8 p.m. Monday night. That's not, one, that's not one person, though, is it? Yeah. No, 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 not the one that person. Is. <laughs> but no, it was just no, constant no. next, next, yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a long, it's a long stretch. Yeah, so how, how do you keep yourself going in those moments? It's, it's actually not too bad when you're the, the person driving. Like, it's right. actually much harder to assist when you're really fatigued and you're tired because your mind wanders and you, and you start to, you know, nod off. Yeah. And Look yeah. at your watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you're doing it, it's actually not too bad. So once you stop, you just collapse. So you just go, I'm bed, I'm gone. You know, it's time to go and get a sleep. So that's that's unreal. So what what's a typical day look like now, just through operating and stuff? Oh, for me, um, most of my days, I, I leave home about between six and six thirty, and go into a ward round, and then either theatre or the rooms. We usually start um, seven in the room, seven thirty um, in theatre. And then we go through till about oh, 9, 9.30, pretty much flat strap, whether it be rooms or theatre. I sort of do alternating days. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you've just got to get a bit of paperwork done night times and weekends and things. So they're, they're long days, but, mm. but you've got your off times generally off. I mean, we're obviously there if people ring us, but, um, you know, when you're off, you're off, which is nice. I don't need much on, you know on call anymore mm. which is good as you're obviously you so there's only you in your business that's a surgeon mm. it's, so a, it's a hard thing yeah. to uh, yeah S- surgery is a, a funny sort of game in that um if you if you referred to get an x-ray say you referred to a practice and and so that's a group practice mm. and they see you and that practice is then a business you know it's something that you can sell or whatever it might be when you're ready to retire you might move a new partner in and you move out or um surgery is a funny sort of game because most of the referrals or all of them really are referred to you not to the practice and so um when you finish work despite the fact you've spent your entire life building up a what you'd class as a small business um when it comes time to retire you really just shut the door and walk out. It's yeah. not worth anything. You can't sell it. It, mm. it, it um, you know, because as soon as you extract yourself from it, it's not really worth anything. You know, and yeah. and um, I suppose you can't have Dr. Steve Andrews without Dr. Steve Andrews working in it. Well, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and generally, you know, if you've spent twenty years of training, most people don't want to then become and be an underling. You know, it's mm. not like it's it's. That people come and say, oh, yeah, I'll work for you and pay some money. Like, people don't particularly want to do that. They want to have their own practice. And so it's uh, it, it's an interesting thing. It, it just doesn't it, it doesn't create anything you can... Like, it doesn't create a business or a product that you can sell. Like, it's, it's just you working and then one day you finish and you close the door and you walk out. Do people do that, though? Have, like, two and three operators in small business as well? Or it's generally themselves? It's generally themselves, yeah. 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 yeah, people have tried to create other models a bit, but it just doesn't seem to work very yeah. well. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's an interesting proposition. I mean, mm. how, how do you do you change that, you know, with group practice? People have tried. Like, they've tried yeah, even yeah. publicly listing practices and have people come on board and you get paid a salary. And the, yeah. but they've, they've tried all sorts of things and, and they're never really financially viable mm. because... You know, no one's going to sign on for less than they can make themselves. So, mm. yeah, true. So yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't really work. The numbers never really add up with it. So, yeah. um, well, given yeah, given how much study you did yourself, you know, you'd probably want to do everything by yourself by the time you're fully qualified. Yeah. Yeah, you don't particularly want to work for somebody else. You want to work for yourself. Not after 20 years, no. No, and and everyone else is the same. And mm. and and then when you finish. Um, the referrals just stop because you, you're not there anymore. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard thing. It's not really a... I, I can't think of a comparative business model, really. Like, you, you know, most, most businesses, you can actually sell goodwill yeah. in the business, but there's, there's no goodwill without you there. That's right. It doesn't work without you. No. 
Mm. I remember, I just want to go back quickly to, um, I remember you, everybody thinks doctors and surgeons and, you know, they, they pretty much think you finish uni, you're on great money. But I remember you telling me early days, I think you said you were straight out of uni, you were on like, 38 grand or 40 grand or something oh, like that, that and you had that's, that's when we were working as a fellow yeah yeah, 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 yeah we yeah. were in sydney yeah you don't you don't make much as a fellow you're there to get experience you mm. know you said oh, i want to go and do more shoulder or elbow or whatever and yeah i think that year we were living in sydney which is never cheap yeah admittedly this is we're talking 20 plus years ago mm. so well it's about 20 years ago actually um stacks 20. yeah yeah, yeah true so, um you know so living in sydney and I think my salary for that year was 36000 for the year before tax. So by the time we'd paid tax and rent, we were already in the red. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to eat yet for and buy all your ex, you know, expenses. And It's funny how people don't see the full story of, <laughs> of anybody's career. You know what I mean? They just yeah. see the shiny bits at the top. And yeah. The, the difference is, though, that in, when you're living in that space for, say, a year, mm. you know it's for a year. You yeah. know, or yeah, three right. years, yeah. in our case, three years, yeah. but you know it's for a finite time, and at the end, you, everything will be all right. Yeah. You know, it's not like... It's got to get through it, though. Yeah, you've got to get a lot of credit cards and a lot of credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can remember standing there, you know, like, um, yeah, you're buying a two-litre thing of milk, and you've got to, you know, fold open the credit cards like this and just start trying them. From yeah, the which one see works. Which one's actually got yeah, some, right. some money on it, you know, and you're oh, yeah. swiping them for a couple of litres of milk, you know, so... Um, and that happens, but as I said, it's not it's not like um, it's a different scenario to when you are living, say, in poverty, where mm. you, you, um, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, yeah. we, we know that you, yes, it's going to be hard for one two or three we'll years, right. but yeah. one day we'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a different. You're not as stressed about it. It's almost an amusing anecdote. You it, know, in the, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, just yeah. getting through those days, though. I suppose. Yeah. 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 You had Zach at that time, didn't you? Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. Um, Zach, we had Zach while I was working in that job. So yeah, it was, um, you know. So, you know, we certainly didn't have any day to do anything in those days. But you know, you don't, you don't have to have money to, don't have, right. to have en- money to entertain a baby. You know, yeah, you that's right. Take it for a walk. Were there ever times you wanted to just take the easier route and go be a GP? Or oh, I don't know if that's the easier route, but just go be a GP for a bit. And earn uh, some money, or you just were solely focused on no, what you I wanted to I, do. I think I knew what I wanted to do. And I, yeah, and look, that's I was, unreal. I was fairly young. Like I'd finished my training by the time I was thirty, and then just went and did some fellowships. Whereas a lot of the guys are older than that; and they've already got kids, and mm. I think that's harder. I think those guys have got it harder. I sort of had it easier, I think, because you know you got it done quickly, and then and then had kids after that. So, so, I think so it's how, easier did, that way. how did you get it done quick quicker than them? Oh. What, yeah, what's the process there? Um, just just every step at the minimum time, you know, like I, like I was 16 when I finished school, so that helped, mm. you know, so I was already... already A year uh, ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, young, yeah, so on the younger end of the spectrum, you know, and, the, and then, um, you know, I only spent two years as a resident, most people spend probably three, I only spent three years, uh, two years as a non-trainee, most people spend three, you know, so... It was just everything I could do shorter time. I probably did it as short as you could do it. Yeah. So I just was younger when I finished. Um, and that's probably just about knowing what I wanted to do. It just I didn't have to, you know, say so some people might take two or three years to make that decision. Yes, this is definitely what I want to do. Well, I'd already made the decision, studied and got the exam and then moved on to the next bit, you know. So, so just because I knew where I was headed. It's so good to, um, Jack, to see somebody like Steve who... He's doing, living the life he wanted. You know what I mean? He like yeah. he, ch- he chased what he wanted to do. We like I said, we again we keep going back to it, but we say this to the kids that we work with in schools: you've got to be happy. You've got to chase what you want to do. Don't just do what other people want you to do. And yeah. you, that's exactly what you did from the start, by the sounds of it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. If you if you end up doing what you want to do, most days are enjoyable. Mm. I, I think you do have to be realistic. I don't think what no matter what job you do. There'll be days you come home and think, gee, that was a crap day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, and that happens to everybody. You, yeah. can't, you can't be unrealistic about it. And, and I, I, I think sometimes some of the younger generations do, they think every day has to be perfect. And 
I think that's an error. Like, you're not going to get that. You're never going to get that. Still hard work, no matter what you want to <coughs> do, is it? If, you're gonna, if, if, if what makes you happy is doing what you like, you've got to work hard at it. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be crap at it, and you won't enjoy that either. Yeah. So you've got you to work hard um, for it to, to actually happen the way you want it to happen. Mm. So um, I- even if, you know, it's not, it's not all going to be nice and easy and you love it. Mm. Like it's going to be, it's going to be a be hard work because to be good at anything takes work, and it's going to be uh, there's going to be days that you, you think this, you know, what am I doing? Mm. You know, and, and mate, I still have those. I, I yeah. Days I come home and I just you know think oh, I've just got to go to bed. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that was dreadful. And uh, but if most of the days you get up and you actually really like what you're doing, then life's good. Mm. You know, so. And uh, I think if you can get that message across to them, you yeah. know, that, that, yeah, that's, they'll be happy kids. No, that's what it's about. We just, we just shared something on social media the other day about one of the kids Jack worked with. He was struggling at school, Theo. Yeah. Um, now he's just joined the, joined the army, been accepted. He's doing excellent. But yeah. what was he like, Jack, when you started? He, he wasn't somebody that was, knew what he wanted to do, but now he's just find his purpose. Mm. I think... Um, yeah, I'd like not to speak too much for him while he's not here because I'd love to have him on to actually mm, chat about yeah, the program one day. But, you know, I think uh, a lot of it was... I think in himself he always knew he was going to do better than what he was doing. Mm. I think he was just doing it because of the people he was hanging around. So you um, become, isn't it? Who you and hang then, around? And then like myself, when I found the boxing gym, uh, it's the same for him. Mm. I, I saw a lot of myself in Theo that... He just needed a voice to listen to, and he found that. And then, yeah, he's really done well for himself. I, I couldn't be prouder of the kid. He's well, he's a man now. Honestly, he's yeah. doing so good for himself, doing something I couldn't do. But I, I, I do agree with Steve that I think that younger generation, well, even my generation, it's thinking every day is going to be perfect when it's definitely not going to be. And and then through social media as well, I think they compare a lot with other people and they think that's how people are actually living their life when in reality that's not what's going on. Mate, social media, they only put the good bits on. That's exactly, it. Exactly. <laughs> so that, put that the that other 99% <laughs> of your life on it. No yeah, one will look shit. at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think they pass it off. Is If you've had a bad day, you've got mm. bad work-life balance. And that, 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 that's not mm. it. Like, mm. that's not... That's not work-life balance. That's just reality. Like you, you got to work hard to achieve, and you, if you're not achieving, you won't enjoy what you're doing. So mm. you got to work hard. Um, the, the, the balance comes in, is, as you said, picking the right thing so that mm. what you're doing is enjoyable. Yeah. And, and yeah. then, you know, and don't expect to have everything go perfect all the time. And if it doesn't, that's not because you had bad work-life balance. It's because you had a bad day. Yeah. You know, and and that happens to everybody. Mm. That's right. I think that's a great way to wrap it up. 100%. That was awesome. Dr. Steve Andrews, thank you very much for your insights and, um, yeah, going through your life. Mate, thank you. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, Steve. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.